Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! and Guardian commentator Giles Fraser and the Times and Spectator columnist Hugo Rifkin. Thank you very much. And just a reminder, of course, that if you're watching this at home, you can join in this debate on Facebook, on Twitter, or by texting 83981 and pushing the red button to see what other texters are saying. The first question tonight is from Jonathan Sutton, please. Is terror part and parcel of modern Britain? Is terror part and parcel of modern Britain? It's a quote from the Mayor of London, who in September last year said, part and parcel of living in a great city is you have to be prepared for things like this. So is it part and parcel of modern Britain? Um, Giles Fraser? Yeah, it feels like a trap, that question. And uh, um, it... T terror is going to be present with us, uh, I think, in the future. I think if you, if you think you can eradicate it, um, it'll come up and bite you somewhere else. Uh, so I think, it is a, I, I think it is a part of our lives. Um, and I think that uh, we have to learn to live with it. That doesn't mean to say we like it or don't try and stop it, but sometimes the efforts to stamp it out uh, are the things that feed it. Uh, and so, uh, having a... Um, you see, I mean, we know why we're talking about this. We're talking about this because of what happened in London yesterday. And part of me would like not to talk about it at all. To, as it were, say, we pray for the, the people who've been killed, we pray for the victims, we think about the... But don't give these people the oxygen of publicity. That's what, that's what, they, that's what they feed on. And there's a... And, and, and how, but, how, sorry, but... It's, a, it's an interesting point, but how do you avoid giving them... No, I understand. We can't do it. That's the world we live in. We have a free press and a media in which, and we talk about it. But there is a little part of me that would quite like the idea of us on Question Time to go, OK, let's move on to the next stuff. Let's just not give these people... Let's not give... Because we are their voices. We're their... We're, and they don't have a voice apart from us. All right, ours. well, let's keep so it let's it would keep be nice brief. to sort of like... Yes, it would be yeah. nice to keep this brief. All right. We know what we think of them. Brandon Lewis. Well, I think there is... Uh, I, have, I have sympathy, actually, for what Giles is saying, but there is also, in terms of making the point that, actually, in the fact that this show is on tonight, and we will be discussing other things, is that clear message that the British way of life, we will get on and go about our normal business, we will not kowtow to this, and British way of life, British values will prevail. And I think that is a really important message. But uh, I do think there is also a space, and it's right, there's been a space over the last 24 hours, and there will be in the days and weeks to come, rightly as well, to also just remember what it does highlight is the phenomenal, and there's no other word for it, heroicism and bravery shown by emergency services, particularly our police, and the PC who lost his life yesterday, going out of his way to run into danger to make safe other people. Um, and we have got an amazing police host that do that for us in one form or another at various levels across the country every day. And coming to the actual point of the question, the, the, the core of the question, I think if we look at what is happening around the world, we, you talk about do we have to get used to this in Britain, I think globally there is a challenge. There is no getting away from the fact we have been <coughs> at a severe threat level for some considerable time. We have to face up to that, we have to recognise that, but we also have to carry on and do our normal work, but be vigilant. As the Mayor of London rightly said, be vigilant and you trust our instincts. But ultimately, do remember, we have phenomenal bravery and heroism across our country every day. And we saw that absolutely highlighted yesterday right. in those actions. <coughs> Le Leanne Wood. Um, I agree with what Simon Jenkins said, the journalist from The Guardian yesterday, who challenged the media not to talk about this. He basically made the case that what terrorists want is us for all to be for all of us to be fearful and for them to get all the attention and so the more we talk about it uh, in the media and, and amongst ourselves uh, as politicians i think that the danger is that we're playing uh, into their hands but the question was about whether or not we have to accept this is part and parcel of our lives 
I do believe a Pandora's box was opened in the Middle East and I do believe that uh, there's no end in sight to that uh, conflict uh, in various pla places there. And while that is ongoing, some people will have grievances and uh, as a result, all of us are potentially uh, unsafe. But I think it is worth paying tribute to all of those people who were in London yesterday who were working to save people's lives and to prevent what could have been a much worse atrocity, I think. Okay. You, sir. Yes. Is all Trump right in what he's doing then by trying to halt people travelling and creating havoc for other people in other countries? Yes. Well, the, the person, as I understand it, the, the, the person who was uh, the perpetrator was born in Kent, mm. so was uh, a British citizen. So I'm not sure how any changes to immigration rules would have made any difference in this mm. case. But he, he was influenced by international terrorism. Well, yes, but that, it, the access to that is available on the internet. I mean, you, you, you can't really affect that by changing mm. immigration rules. Hugo Rifkin. Yeah, um, if, if I may, I, I couldn't disagree more with, with, with the, uh, the, the, the first bit of the, the first answer there. I, I don't want to live in a country where terrorists attack us and we don't report it and where we don't know about it and where the, the press, <laughs> that there's an agreement that, that the press shouldn't say. I mean, we, terrorism doesn't need to make us afraid. I kept thinking yesterday of the words of John Stewart, the American comedian, after 9-11, and he said that 9-11 didn't make him fear for society because he looked at what had happened and he saw a handful of people had crashed aeroplanes into two buildings and hundreds of people had gone into those buildings to save the people inside. And he said he'd take those odds every day. And I think that's, that's, that's the message you take away from terrorism. We look at what happened yesterday. It doesn't make us feel worse about our country. It shouldn't make us feel more frightened about our country. Uh, we can find a, pos a positive message if we want one. I think, I think there was a really, really key point made by a colleague this morning who saw something on the underground coming back into London this morning but underground workers had put a notice up that said something along the lines of, and I'm sorry if my words aren't quite right, but basically, we will make a cup of tea and get on with it. And that, I thought, was the right message. You said, in the, the spectacles there, yes. Obviously, this is a terrible incident in London, but should our police, um, police officers be armed uh, follow, following, this, um, following this incident? Near Griffith. Well, I think, first of all, I want to express my deepest sympathy to the victims, families and friends, and... Obviously, we remember PC Keith Palmer and the work that he did as a Metropolitan Police Officer trying to defend us in Parliament. I think this is a, a matter, an operational matter, which is something which the police themselves um, need to decide. We in this country have a long tradition of having both armed and unarmed police. And if the police decide that there should be more armed police, that's a matter for them. But what is also important is that we have that very strong link it, between our communities and the police and so often it is the police who are the eyes and ears in our communities mm. who can actually work together with communities mm. can give information to the security services which can help to uh, prevent terrorism and I think we should remember that our security services are very highly regarded across the world have time after time actually prevented terrorist incidents. But the person who asked that question of course he was unarmed the policeman who was stabbed mm. to death wasn't he? Is it, you think he should have been armed? I just um, think maybe the circumstances um, um, might, might have been different had the officer been armed. Yeah. Right. It's an unfair playing field, um, I, I feel. The woman next to you, and then I'll come to you, sit down here. Yeah, I think um, we're talking about not discussing it, but I, I feel for the victims, if we don't talk about it, do they then get swept under the carpet and forgotten about, that they're, mm. you know, they've lost their lives? It's not about, about um, giving the terrorists... Um, I think, I think a the platform, but it's just those individuals that, that lost their mm. lives and were injured. If we don't discuss it and, and talk about it, then they just get forgotten about it. I think, I think you're absolutely right. No one's saying that we just have a, a bl blanket, don't talk about it. That no one's saying that at all. But, but we are talking about th there is a way of responding to this, which is people compete in outrage. And then the media gets itself terribly frothed, frothed up about it and you end up... And that's the sort of thing we need to avoid because that's the sort of thing that does the terrorists work yeah. for them. But so we need to be... This sort of calm yeah. and... Calm, I know this tube, station, this tube station sign where it said, Dear terrorist, um, you're not going to change us. 
You're not going to change us. Uh, we're the, it's something like we're Londoners, and we've seen this worse before. We're going to go and have a cup of tea. Thank you very much, but we ain't going to change. And that's the right answer to, to this, as, as well as remembering and praying for all of those people who've lost their lives in this all terrible right. The woman up there on the, on the far right, there, yes. Just if you can get to her. I think that... By not discussing something, you actually increase the fear of it. You know, people are afraid of the unknown, and I think that the way that we need to respond is by not changing our actions, but not just pretending that these things don't happen. So we need to carry on with our daily lives, but I think to just completely not speak about it would actually make things far worse. Well, and, and I, I think I, there is an issue. I, th I think that's a really good point in that question around having, that co having the conversation to have the confidence about how safe we are. And I think it comes to Nia's point. We are very fortunate in this country to have world-renowned um, security services who keep us safe. We've heard over the last few months, the amount of times they have kept us safe and prevented things over the last couple of years. And we have got, I would argue, the best police force in the world who work every day to keep us safe. And that confidence of being able to say that and have that conversation is important in us having that ability to go on and live our lives as we do every day. Jo Jonathan Sutton, who asked the question, what, what, what do you make of what you've heard? You with all what's been said. I don't think we should make a thing of it. And I think we are, unfortunately, in a world now where we do have to accept these things happen, but I don't think we should allow it to change how we go about our daily lives. Absolutely. Because if we do, they won't. And we should be very, very proud in this country that we do have a system where our police police by consent. And the police themselves are immensely protective and rightly proud of the fact that the majority of our police are unarmed. And that is something in our country I think is worth valuing and holding right. on to. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll take a couple more points. A couple more points from, from our audience, and then uh, the man at the very back there, and then we'll move on to another question. Yes. Yes, does sir. the media have a responsibility not to glorify terrorism? How do you think it does that? Well, they talk about the acts of terrorism, they talk about the terrorists. They should be looking at ways of not glorifying it in uh, so much and talking more about the victims. And let's have, let's have a lesson on television. OK, and, and you sit down here. There's been a certainly a lot on television with not a great deal... Uh, I mean, the things get said over and over again once you get into a new cycle on things like this, don't they? And you don't actually gain very I much information. My, my you said... No, hold on a second, Leanne. No, hold on, Leanne. The policing here. minister's mentioned a few times the police are doing a great job. Well, why then every year are you cutting police budgets? <laughs> the same blue line is getting thinner. Well, I'm not going to shy away from the fact that over the last few years we have had to make some really difficult decisions around public sector spending. We all know, and you've heard before, around the problems we've got with debt in this country, we've had to deal with that. But in the budget last year we protected police spending and we've also increased the spending. In this area, counter-terrorism has gone up 30%. The Prime Minister outlined some of where that money is being spent earlier today. So we are very focused on that area. The police do have reserves. The police have got the resources they need to do their job, decided by those professionals, the chief constables. Mm. And when somebody talked earlier on about we should have more armed police, our armed police, I've seen some over the last few weeks at various training centres, they are very highly trained specialists, do an amazing but, but, job. But you've but said they that do before, but no, hang, they on they hang on a second, Minister, take his point. You have cut spending by 25% over five years, and there are 20,000 fewer police than there were five years ago. Well, there if is... If you were to listen now, morale of the police force is at a low. How do you know this? Because I'm an ex-police officer myself and I speak to officers now and there's a lot of police officers who would leave the service because of the way they've been treated. Well, I, I do speak to police officers of all ranks on a regular basis. Most weeks when I'm out visiting and I talk to police officers and they are rightly proud of what they do, as I've said. We have had to make some really tough decisions, but policing is also changing. You know, we, we all know recorded crime, traditional crime, is down 25% since 2010. We've got the challenge of the digital world and cybercrime and fraud that's coming more forward. Prisons, then? But we are also increasing the spend on areas like this, counter-terrorism, to make sure that we've got the resilience we need in this country and that the police have got the resources they need to be able to keep us safe as they do. All right, and you're not content with that, uh, briefly, well, if you would, Leanne. So crime is going go down question. and more prisons uh, are being built. Is uh, that one of the reasons the why crime is going the down? The cuts then? are there to try and reduce the debt, yet the debt has not been reduced. So none of this makes a lot of sense to me. OK. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go to a, a, our second question. Uh, just before we go to our second question, I should say this, um, because it's Monday... Uh, that we have a special question time from Birmingham next Monday. Britain after Brexit, about what happens after Article 50 has been triggered. 
And Thursday's question time comes from Carlisle, and the week after that from Gillingham. So if you want to come to Birmingham next Monday, Carlisle on Thursday, the following week, Gillingham, there's the address to apply to. Let's have our second question. Uh, Jessica Berry, please. How will the Welsh economy cope when the EU funding and subsidies stop? How will the Welsh economy cope when EU funding... <laughs> ..receives a good deal more money than the rest of the UK from the EU? Uh, Hugo Rifkind. I think, I mean, all, all across Britain, it's, it's going to be difficult. I mean, the economy is already is, is, is struggling as a result of a, a far, far lower pound. Um, I'm constantly baffled by the way that the Wales voted so, so overwhelmingly for Brexit. I, I, I can see no, no logic to it. Um, one has to hope that the government sees its role as being to step in and fill the gap of a lot of the funding that a lot of areas, including much of Wales, will be losing from the EU. This doesn't seem like a government particularly inclined to do that sort of thing. Um, so we will have to wait and see. OK. Giles Fraser. Uh, well, I, I'm a Brexiter. I voted enthusiastically for Brexit, and I, I'm still enthusiastic about it. And for me, what was most important about it wasn't the economic argument, but that actually uh, it enhanced our democracy, that it collapsed the gap between people and power. For me, power had become, in Brussels, had become too distant, too alien, uh, and it wasn't something that uh, many people felt that they had under their, their control. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it, it, they didn't feel it was there for them. So, uh, because I believe in the power of democracy and the way in which ordinary people can control politics through democracy, that's, my, that's where my faith lies. And that I think it may well be the case that, that the rebalancing of the economy that will be necessary will be hard for lots of people. For lots of us, it'll be hard. But I think in the long term, if we have our destiny in our own hands, it'll be much better for all of us. All right. Do you know, Giles, how callous you sound? Well, you, you talk about... You, um... You talk about destiny and democracy, these are fine things. Having a job is a fine thing. A healthy economy is a fine so, thing. So what, do you what, what cost is acceptable here? So I, I'm sorry, but I think democracy really is a fine thing. And I thought we, we, we have a great parliamentary tradition, which we saw being attacked yesterday by terrorists, and it is something that we should rightly be proud of in this country, our democracy. We should be rightly proud of our democracy and our democratic institutions, and we should not be... Uh, giving away the birthright of our vote to Brussels or to anybody else, right. that is something that you, well, uh, that you are given. It is your right, your birthright. Yeah, well, you let's not rerun that argument, what because we, that argument has been decided by the, by, the, uh, by the referendum. I, Near I, Griffith. I just want to ask, Near what Griffith. politics has benefited oh, no. from this? Near, okay. Near Griffith, I'll come to you. Um, I think the really important thing is that not only Wales, but areas across the UK have benefited from EU funding specifically given to disadvantaged areas. And what really worries me is that Brandon's colleague, Alan Cairn, Secretary of State for Wales, has specifically said that there can be no guarantee that these areas will continue to, to, to receive that money. Now, that does worry me because this was money that was specifically given to, in order to boost the economies in areas where there is need to do so, to bring up the level of those economies, to have greater equality across the UK. And it worries me considerably that we now have a government that will ignore criteria and will simply say, well, perhaps we'll have a pet project here or a pet project there, and we won't get the distribution of wealth that we'd like to see. Right. Brandon Lewis, want to reply to that? <laughs> Well, I, think, I mean, the reality is, I think well, there was a decision made. We've got to get a good deal for this country. I'm confident we will get a good deal for this country. We have already, the government has already um, been very clear that we guarantee the uh, money for the EU structure and the investment projects, which are already signed before we leave the EU, even if they continue beyond the departure. I think the point that the Secretary of State for Wales, Alan Cairns, was making, I think he's absolutely right, which is we are going into a negotiation, and what comes after that we will develop through that negotiation. Yes, but we have I'm confident we will get money. a good deal for this country, and it is about getting a deal for everybody in all parts of the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah, but we have the same amount of money. When we come out of the EU, we have the money that we don't put into the EU. And the decision about how to use that money comes back to the Westminster government. Now, the point I'm making 
is that instead of using the criteria of you know, which are the most disadvantaged areas that need their economies boosting, um, your colleague Alan Cairns and other colleagues in, in, the, in the Cabinet are actually saying they're going to scrap this altogether. All right. um, well, actually, what they're right. saying is there is a negotiation, and that negotiation will go ahead The negotiation with Europe is nothing to do with how we spend the money that we don't actually give to Europe. You, it see, it, it the, woman, the woman on the right have. there. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to point out that uh, Gwynedd as a county voted to remain one of the few areas in Wales. Um, and, and secondly, secondly, I'd like to know, um, as North Wales is usually the poor relative to South <coughs> Wales, I'd like to know how people are going to secure investment for North Wales and not just it being Cardiff-centric. So are you alarmed by the way... Are you alarmed by what... You're, you're fearful about what may happen, are you? Very much so. I work for the third sector and I see firsthand how heavily subsidised we are by the EU. All right, let's hear from one of the other people. I'll come to you, Leanne, obviously, after that. Yes, you. The spectacles there in the back row, yes? Um, I, I, it, it's symptomatic the way you responded to that question. You, 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 the question is about Wales and you told us about democracy from a London perspective. Who are you I, talking about? I feel, oh, I feel there's a democratic deficit. You're talking about Giles Fraser? Uh, yes, yeah. I feel there's a democratic deficit for us here. I live on Anglesey. We have opposed through all democratic voices that we have some plans, for example, against the national grid. And we are not getting that voice through, although every representative voice from Anglesey, from community council, county councils, assembly members, MP, even, it was even discussed in the assembly. But because we don't have powers over energy, I have a democratic deficit. It doesn't enhance my democratic voice to be outside of Brexit. Right. I'd have more protection in Europe. OK, and you say in the back there. <clears throat> You, Hugo, you said that you were shocked by Wales um, voting <coughs> leave as a majority. Do you think the people of Wales were misled or misinformed uh, in terms of the whole process of Brexit? Uh, you know, in the building we're sitting in now was partially funded by the EU. Do you think that they were misinformed in terms of the EU projects that benefited them you know, so well? All right, br briefly on that, because I, the, I want to bring Leanne in on the overall position of the economy, but what do you think? Um, I couldn't say. I think, the, I think the, the various bits of the Leave campaign and Leave EU, the other Leave campaign, worked very hard to prevent Brexit from being a debate about the economy. And they managed to do that. They managed to turn it into a debate about, well, God knows what, but mainly, mainly immigration. Uh, I, think that was, I think that was misleading. I think that was willfully misleading. Um, I wouldn't like to say that the people of Wales were, were fooled. That's, that, that's up to them. But, but the, the vote is, is a mystery to me. Leon Wood. Well... I want to go to the point that was made uh, up there because the powers that be in Westminster are not listening to Wales. We're ignored on just too many different issues. Plaid Cymru worked with the Welsh Government to put together a, a white paper outlining exactly what Wales's needs were out of the Brexit negotiations. We currently get £658 million per year from the EU and that is more than we put in as Wales. And Plaid Cymru put amendments down in Westminster to guarantee that funding beyond Brexit. And we uh, included that as a, a clause in the government's white paper as well. The Prime Minister has said that she will consult the nations um, that make up the UK. I've not seen any evidence that she has. She what kind of consultation <coughs> would you expect? Any want? consultation, any <laughs> listening at all would be good. <laughs> we've, seen, we've seen nothing. Well, that, that's, so that's, that's just not correct. Well, but if you look order, at... Put, putting aside the fact that the Prime Minister has been here three times in the last few weeks and, and She's in come and said herself, nothing. But She's equally, there is nothing. also... A part, and there is the white paper and the negotiations going on. I myself have sat on joint ministerial council meetings with ministers from Wales and Scotland and, and Ireland as well discussing the issues. In my case, it was around the security and law enforcement issues and how, what the impact of that is as we come through. What Brexit. about so the guarantees on our funding? Those then? discussions are going on, but we are at the start of what will be two years' negotiations about getting the right deal but, for but all the United Kingdom with 27 countries. Hang on, the Prime Minister came here and I think spoke to the Conservative Party, didn't she? 
She was, well, not, not all three times. No, she came to the conference last week, but she has been here several times in the last few weeks. And but has she spoken as I to say, Leanne? Look, and Wales Blake is going to lose £650 million every year. We want some guarantees from the UK government that we're not going to lose that. We've already got too many weaknesses and challenges in the Welsh economy. We don't have the tools and the powers to actually rectify those problems in our assembly in Cardiff Bay. Well, so why did you vote to leave in that case? Well, I campaigned for a Remain I know. vote. But and why did I put the case leave? very strongly for Remain. I can't explain to you why people voted to Even leave. Even in your constituency? I immigration was a big question. In your constituency? M immigration was a big question right throughout the country. And many people uh, read tabloid newspapers. And More people get their news from tabloid newspapers in Wales than they do from <laughs> Welsh media sources. So they don't listen to you, you're saying, you know, your I, own constituents... It's very difficult to get a, a, a message across when you've not got a very strong Welsh media, David. It, okay. it, it's very patronising. It, it, it's very patronising. All this, all this thing you get from Remain is saying uh, people were fooled and uh, they were all idiots. <laughs> And uh, 52 no, 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 this is the message. This is, no, this is the I'm message people that. are hearing. I'm not the message that. people are hearing is that they were fooled. It was all to do with the media. There was tabloid newspapers and so forth. People are grown-ups, and they voted in Wales. They voted to leave, and they understood. They understood like other people what they were voting for. And the idea that you come on afterwards and you say, "Oh, they don't really understand, poor little dears." No, I won't treat you like no, poor little I dears. Said I don't Wales under understood. I said I don't understand. All right. I didn't say people. Let's go back to the money question. I don't understand the, the way. The man up there in the, in the blue, well, and shirt. blue and purple shirt there. Right. The reason that uh, so many people in Wales voted the way they did was because they know deep down they're going to be worse off economically throughout this whole debacle, if you will. But the thing is, where I come from in Wrexham, it was a massive leave vote. And the way the town has become over the last few years, you can see why. Um, it's... it's People can't get jobs because we have such an influx of cheap labour from Europe and it's very sort of demeaning and it's, it doesn't matter how Wales spends the money anyway because within five years of the UK leaving there'll be no EU anyway. So, so just to... It's, it's all, it's and you, all, it's you, all from, domino effect. From your point of view, you think the, the Welsh economy will be better off, that Wrexham will be better off than it can cope? Um, we'll wait and see, okay. to be honest, but what about I, the question, I don't want to be tied to a dying union at the end of the day. OK, Jessica Berry, who asked the question, what do you think? Um, personally, I find it extremely worrying. Um, I am on a committee for, for our part of the local service in our village. Um, a lot of funding that we have, we envisage, might come from the EU. Um, like the lady said down there, an awful lot of the third sector funding, which is replacing the cuts that the councils are having to make, are being funded by the EU, and I don't, I, we're just going to end up with nothing. But do you, what, what is your view of what Leanne said about uh, wanting the Prime Minister and the government to give guarantees? Do you, do you feel that the um, voice of Wales is being heard or ignored? I'd love it if Westminster did give a guarantee, but they never said they were going to, and I, would, I very much doubt that they will. OK, the woman over there in the second row from you. I think from what Leanne's been saying, that Westminster hasn't been listening, it isn't listening, and it's not likely to listen in the future. So let's have a grown-up debate about independence in Wales. Yeah. About independence. OK, we may come to that <laughs> later on, because you can't visit Wales without having a question about independence, but we won't come straight to it. You say in the front here, and then we'll move on to other questions. Well, I voted for uh, uh, leave, and I fought for uh, Labour leave uh, here in Bangor at the clock, uh, and I voted for direct democracy and I voted for a fairer immigration system and I'm actually married to an immigrant, uh, a non-EU immigrant, so I'm not racist. OK. <laughs> well, we've gone, we've gone far away from the money issue. Let, we may come back to a bit more of that later. Let's go on to another question, though, because time is always against us on question time. David Arkwright, can we have your question? Is it fair to families of victims murdered by Martin McGuinness and the IRA to heap so much praise on him. Is it fair to families of victims murdered by Martin McGuinness and the IRA to heap so much praise on him? Brandon Lewis. Well, I, I, I think we've got to... The, there's two sides to this. First of all, I, I couldn't, and none of us I, will condone what happened in his earlier life. But the reality is, in his later life, he was 
undoubtedly a very, very important part of getting through that peace process and where we are now in Northern Ireland. And I think it is right that's recognised. Um, but that doesn't mean that anybody should forget what many victims will feel from what happened before that. He never apologised. He never apologised no, for his think, time with the IRA. It's, I think he? it's one of those things. If we, if, if we look at... so, I mean, he's a very extreme example of the fact that many, many people who do... who. Um, are involved in things around the world throughout history have got very, very, very complex individuals. And he has done things that I would never dream to condone and I wouldn't have thought anybody in this audience, anybody watching this programme would ever want to condone. But he was also, and it is right to be recognised, that there was a point in his life where he became an integral part of delivering a really important peace process in Northern Ireland. And that's just a reality of what happened. All right. Hugo Rifkin. I think the reason why men like Martin McGuinness had to bring peace to Northern Ireland is because men like Martin McGuinness brought war to Northern Ireland. And um, it's... Um, the, the point is, though, that, that, that making peace, a peace process, it, in, it entails compromise, it entails sacrifice. Part of the sacrifice made by the victims of the IRA uh, entailed that, that men like Martin McGuinness got to spend the rest of their life wandering around as if they were fully functional, moral human beings. And it had to be done. And I'm, I'm not, I, I, I can't regret that it was done, because there is peace in Northern Ireland, but that doesn't mean it was true. Okay. Neil Griffith. Well, I absolutely condemn the violent acts that Martin McGuinness may have had part in in the earlier part of his life. And I think the pictures that we've seen on our television screens this week have just brought back the horror of the troubles in Northern Ireland. But I think if you look at who went to his funeral... There was respect in the end for what he did in terms of working with people across the political divide in Northern Ireland, working with people like Ian Paisley to try to forge some way forward. So I would say it's not praise, I would say it's respect for trying to bring some sort of peace in Northern Ireland. It's a long, long process. It's by no manner finished yet and there is still the past to be dealt with and there needs to be a proper process for dealing with that past uh, before Northern Ireland can really go D forward. David Outcroft, what do you think? I think the reason that he's gone down the, the line of uh, talking is because he saw it was coming to an end, the IRA, uh, the police and the uh, MI5 had infiltrated into the IRA and he could see that there was going to be an end uh, and he thought, I'll go down the political way yeah. and make life easier for myself. Yeah. Ian Wood. I think um, we must remember the victims on both sides of this conflict. It was horrific when it was uh, going on. Both the Unionist and the Republican side uh, lost uh, people. And the deaths of civilians is, is always, always wrong. And there were 300 and... 3,352 people who lost their lives during the Troubles in Ireland and I can fully understand uh, why those people who were affected can perhaps never ever forgive the actions of those people who perpetrated uh, those crimes. But I think that peace was secured as a result of uh, a change of tack and okay we could argue that Peace could have come much earlier, but it did come when it came. And uh, I think that it saved many lives had it not come at, at that point. So um, Martin McGuinness is known for his IRA involvement. Yes, there's no doubt about that. But I think he should also be recognised for his role in the Good Friday uh, Agreement. All right. <coughs> the, the, um, Charles Fraser, just a reminder of the question. Is it fair to the families of victims murdered by the IRA to heap so much praise? No, it's not you? fair. Um, but I'm afraid peacemaking is often not fair. It's an incredibly messy business, making peace. And one of the things that is so morally complicated is that sometimes justice, getting, getting your just desserts, actually perpetuates violence. And, and it doesn't lead to peace. And so many pieces are messy and not entirely just around the world. And I think you have to... Look, if, if they'd have killed my mum or my kids, I'd have found it impossible to forgive. But yet there is no future without forgiveness. There is no f future for, 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 for Northern Ireland. And if you go down this Norman Tebbit line that, uh, you know, he was a coward 
and, uh, and uh, there's nothing to be... Uh, Norman Tebbit would never have made peace in Northern Ireland. The idea that you can make peace by winning is nonsense. And furthermore, um, not only is it morally problematic to make peace, but you have to do it. We will have to do that also with the people who are putting bombs and, and in our cities today. Why do you and say... Do it. Why do you say... We, we will have to do it. If we want to have peace, yeah. we have to talk... We have to talk to the bad guys. Why do you, you say do Norman it. Tebbit would not ever have made peace? Because his approach, his approach is that we have to somehow win, militarily win. And there is no way of doing that. That's the sort of false... Uh, the idea that um, it's just all about your truth, your way of looking at things, and you have to give up your truth. There's a wonderful... Um, there's a wonderful poem by uh, an Israeli poet called um, uh, Yehuda Amakai, and it's, From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring, he says. And the whole idea is, if you completely stick to you being right, to your justice, to what you see, there won't be any peace. You actually have to shift, and it's uncomfortable, and it's morally problematic, and that's why we have to... The, yes, today, the day of his funeral, I will not be standing up and condemning him as the first thing he did. Of course, I prefer his later work to his earlier work. But uh, actually, there would be no peace in Northern Ireland without Martin McGuinness, right. and that has to be remembered. The man with spectacles in the middle there, so come up. Thank you. Um, yes. the, the, the IRA created more mayhem in this country than ISIS has ever done. Yep. And will we, in 25 years' time, be, if you like, uh, praising the peacemaker from ISIS. Uh, and you, sir? Uh, I quite agree with the turbulent priest. We've always had to negotiate with uh, nasty people. We had to do with Jomo Kenyatta in Kenya and Macarius in Cyprus. You think they were nasty people? Uh, well, I know they were nasty people. I was there in both places at the time. Right, OK. And, and you, sir, in blue? Do you say there's no future without forgiveness. At what point do you forgive a terrorist? The, 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 the question, it seems to me, is do you want to have a future? Do you want to have a future that's peaceful? Or do you actually want to go for this tit-for-tat, you, you go for them, they go for you, you go for them? At some point, that has to be... that, that You have to break the cycle, the tit-for-tat cycle of violence. All right. And the way of doing that is not always clean and easy. So okay. at what point do you it, forgive them? Hugh, Hugh, let Hugh go answer this one, because he's I'm, had quite a... Sh I'm, I'm uncomfortable with, with, with an, uh, an attack on, on Norman Tebbit in, in this context. I think in, in this context, if only this context, Norman Tebbit is rather beyond reproach. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was blown up in the, in the Brighton bombing. His, his wife never walked again. This was, this was over, over 30 years ago. Um, and his points, the, his, his main point, the reason why he never forgave Martin McGuinness, was that Martin McGuinness never seemed to believe that he'd done anything that required forgiveness. Um, and I think, I, I, as I said at, when we began this discussion, I fully understand that peace requires compromise on both sides. I think it would have been a lot easier for the victims of the IRA if men like Martin McGuinness had admitted that maybe they'd put a foot wrong in killing so many people. OK. All right. <laughs> We'll go on, we'll change tap once more and have a question from Tamsin Slynn, please. Tamsin Slynn. Um, is being an MP a full-time job? Is be <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know what that's about. <laughs> I think it's about the former Chancellor of the Exchequer. Is that the... Yeah, yeah, but we've got three MPs here and they've all got other jobs, one sort or another, we'll find out about, I think. Yes? No. Well, you lead your parties. <laughs> And you're a shadow defence secretary. Anyway, let's. Uh, um, oh, George Osborne, of course, became editor of the Evening Standard. He also um, makes 650 grand a year for advising Black Rock and all that. Um, is, it, is it a full time job? Are you a. La Leanne Wood, what about you? It's the only job that I've got. Um, I think it should be a full time job. It's a privileged position to hold. I'm an assembly member, not a, a member of parliament, but. Um, it's a very privileged position to hold and it's a, it's a very time-consuming job, particularly if you're a leader of a political party as well, perhaps it's even more time-consuming, but it's a decent salary, people should be able to uh, live quite well and comfortably on the salary of an MP and it seems to me that people who want more than one job are a bit greedy. Okay. <laughs> 
Brandon Lewis, where are you on your, your former Chancellor? Well, actually, I think the fact that he was the Chancellor is, is, highlights the point. He was a Chancellor of the Exchequer, which is a very, very time-consuming job and still a, a, and a Member of Parliament for his constituency. And in fact, the time he took being Chancellor didn't stop him being a good constituency MP, so much so that he was re-elected whilst Chancellor in 2015. So I think in that sense, you can, you, ministers, all of us, are doing a ministerial job as well as a constituency job. I think there's also the fact that Parliament's got a long history and track record of having great assets brought into Parliament by members of Parliament who are backbenchers, who have interests and jobs and work and experience from outside of Parliament. I think it would be a dangerous thing to have members of Parliament particularly backbenchers, who are not able to take outside work. But it's also right... What about the conflict of interest? But it's also... That's what I say. It's also, let me just finish here. It's also right that there is a body that assesses whether somebody is yeah. doing something that's within the ministerial code, if you're a minister, and whether it's um, a conflict of interest or not, and that body is looking at um, all of these matters, including... Conflict what conflict about, well, that, that body this will look at George's in. It's a matter for the what parliamentary about, standards body. That, who that's where the, the proprietor of it... What, but you're, you're, you're a Tory minister... And the story going around, of course, is that he was sacked by Theresa May rather peremptorily uh, from his post as Chancellor of the Exchequer. He's become editor of the Evening Standard, London Evening Standard, from which point he will conduct, wage a campaign against Theresa May and against what the government's doing in the Brexit negotiations. Now, is that, is that a legitimate thing for him to do as an MP? Well, from uh, the back benches, uh, I'm not going to tell a free press of any description um, what they should be doing. It's up to the media to assess. It's up to us as a government to do our job to the best of our ability to deliver for the country and to answer for that, whoever happens to be editor of any given newspaper. So you're not worried about that? The simple question around whether a member of parliament who is a backbench MP can do another job, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't be able to have ministers who are members of parliament with constituencies. OK. Uh, ministers, uh, but, different to a job outside the institution. I, I, I think it? most people would take yes. the view, understand that being a Chancellor is as much a full-time job as editing a newspaper or having right. a consultancy what job about, what about being, what about being the fourth? Being what about being the fourth Shadow Defence Secretary in a year? Is that, <laughs> is that a full-time job? Um, I as think well? that, can, I, you make, can you cope with being an MP and with the Labour Party in its current state? Well, absolutely. <laughs> um, I, no, the important part is that you know, when you're an MP, you have duties in Parliament and you have duties for your constituency. And part and parcel of being an MP is that you do either serve on the front bench or you may be a backbencher. Now, there are backbenchers who work extremely hard because we have committees who scrutinise what the front bench do. And so that is an integral part of what you're doing. And I think it's incumbent on every single MP to take it very seriously and to take it as a full-time job. Um, I think that alone is very important but then we come on to the issue of conflict of interest and I do think there is there is a real issue about being an editor of a London-based newspaper when you're trying to represent a Cheshire constituency I just don't think that he talks about the interest of Londoners and being more London than Londoner and so forth I just don't think that's what the people of Tatton want to hear all right you said it I, uh, I've got a couple of friends who are MPs, uh, Conservative MPs actually, and they, I don't think they're paid enough. I think the Chief Executive... <laughs> hold on a minute. The Chief Executive of Anglesey County Council and Gwyneth County Council are paid about three times more than an MP. And I bet the Chancellor of Bank University is paid a great deal more than an MP as well. And they do it for four years and they might lose their job at the next election. So why shouldn't talent be encouraged to come in? You've got really good barristers, uh, some army officers go into politics with their army pension, it's a lot of money, I agree, Leanne, but if you can earn more in the city, why don't you do that? Parliament needs talent. So this you attract is, talent is it, you think this is synthetic outrage about George Osborne? I do, totally synthetic. OK. It, and the woman at the very back, I'll come to you, Charles. In the very back there, yes. Um, surely being an MP should be an absolute privilege, um, to, and you should be serving the people of Tatton um, in his, all his interests. And it, obviously it is a conflict of interest when his seat is down the country um, and to say that MPs aren't paid enough I think is an absolute slap in the face for hard working people. Right, exactly. that you, you As with any job the question of whether you can have, a, have another job while doing your job is, is a matter for your employer and, uh, and George Osborne's employers in this context are, are the voters of Tatton and um, you can, you can play this both ways. If he was the editor of a national newspaper, if he was the editor of, I don't know, the, the Daily Mirror, unlikely, but if he was, perhaps the voters of Tatton would think, you know what, this is great for Tatton, 
that our editor is the editor, that our, our MP is the editor of the Daily Mirror and he's going to look out for our interests and promote us across the nation. I think the people of Tatton would be inclined to wonder why a man whose own new employer has just described him as London through and through wishes also to be their MP. Um, if I are... think they'd be looking forward to having Martin Bell back. Well, I mean, he yeah. had to sort Tatton out after Neil Hamilton, and yep. yet again, you know, poor old Tatton is getting a raw deal. I think it's, the, it's the, boundary, the boundaries it's are changing them. anyway, aren't there, in Tatton, I think, this time round, aren't they? Uh, well, we have the Boundary Commission, yeah, but, it's it's but at the moment the draft is that it would change, yes. That it would change, so it might not have a constituency to go to. Giles Fraser. Um, the George Osborne thing stinks. It absolutely <laughs> stinks. And it, and, it, and, it, and it's not just because he can't get by on the £650,000 that he's given by BlackRock uh, and how that'll work with him editing the city pages of a newspaper. That's not... The problem is not now that the Northern Powerhouse means Hampstead to him rather than somewhere a bit further. Do you know what the problem is? We, we all fear that too much power in this country is in too few people's hands. And the idea that that the, he is an MP and uh, the, he runs a newspaper and he's going to be the Archbishop of Canterbury and he's <laughs> going to be everything, whatever it is, it, it just stinks. And the job of, a, job of a newspaper, one more thing, the job of a newspaper is to keep these politicians honest. That's one of the jobs of a newspaper. And the idea that an MP and all his chums now are running an important newspaper in London, everybody thinks it stinks and it does. Okay. <laughs> Priests can be guardian columnists, can they, without any conflict hmm. with God? No. <laughs> <laughs> no to tell you the truth, a, there is a real conflict. There is a real conflict of interest, actually. It's really hard to do. Yeah, because you have to be quite nasty as a columnist, you have to be quite nice as a priest. That's the conflict. <laughs> James Cook, let's have your question. Should Wales have a referendum like Scotland? Now we are leaving the EU. So, should Wales... Yes, applause from two or three hands, but not only... <laughs> um, should Wales have a referendum like Scotland? Um, well, Nia Griffith, what do you think? Well, I think that we in Wales are very, very passionate and proud to be Welsh, and I think you sometimes see that on the rugby field. The results are not always uh, quite what we desire, though. Um, but I do think we need to listen very carefully to the people of Wales. 94% of the people of Wales have repeatedly shown in poll after poll that actually, whilst being very proud to be Welsh, we're actually not in the least bit interested in an independent Wales. There is actually no call for that in Wales, and it's not what people on the doorstep tell me, it's not what people in the, the shopping centres tell me. There are far more important issues that they want to focus on. But you're... Yes. <laughs> Look, can I just quote you your First Minister of Wales, Carwin Jones, who said, people in Wales are going to start saying the government's listening to the Scots, we need to be like them. It's a dangerous path for the UK if they don't listen to Wales. I, I, I think that you know, we in Wales, it's very important that we do have our voice and our First Minister speaks up for us. But I don't agree with the idea of having um, another referendum in Scotland either. I think this is a distraction by, by Nicola Sturgeon. I think when she can't even tell the people um, what will happen after Brexit, she can't even tell them whether she could or would take Scotland back into the European Union, or even what currency they would have, I think there's exactly the same problem for people in Scotland. They're right. being given a, an opportunity to, to make a decision when they don't even have the so, facts. So, Leanne, should Wales have a referendum like Scotland? Well, the reason that there is going to be a referendum in Scotland is because Scotland voted to remain in the European Union and the Prime Minister is ploughing ahead with a hard Brexit against their will after promising to consult and uh, failing to. So there's been a material change of circumstances uh, in Scotland. And let's deal with Wales. If, that's if Scotland we've... does become an independent country, the UK will no longer exist. And I believe in self-determination. I believe that decisions about Wales should be made in Wales, including <laughs> that decision about uh, our own future. It's... Uh, there could be very big changes. Uh, the tectonic plagues of UK politics are shifting. And uh, what, is, what does it mean for Wales? If Scotland becomes independent, the UK will no longer exist. We will be subsumed in some kind of England and Wales entity. 
how will our voice be heard then when we're already ignored by the Westminster Parliament? So I think there should be a multi-option referendum. Independence should be included in that. But it should also enable people, the 43% of people in Wales, who want more powers, including powers over our economy, so that we can actually address some of the problems that we're facing, then those people should have their say as well. And, and, and Leanne, point, just to make it clear, when, when, do you want it, when do you want it? Self-determination. Yes, I get that. When, when do you want it? I mean, do you think it should happen before the Brexit negotiations are done, the kind of we're in consultative a different, referendum? We're in a different place Everything's to, up. to Scotland. Everything's, yes. we're, we're, we're on a different uh, stage on our journey. All right. Um, so we're not going to have our referendum at the same time as Scotland. But if Scotland leaves, then that will constitute a material change of circumstances in, in for Wales. Wales. I get it. And okay. I believe that it's people here in Wales who should decide on our own future. You, you are a um, Well, I'm, I am Scottish, as people will be able to tell from my broad and near impenetrable accent. <laughs> um, and, I, and I'm a unionist. I, I believe in, that Scotland should be part of the United Kingdom. What worries me as a unionist, more than, than Scottish nationalists or indeed Welsh nationalists, is the tone set by the Conservative government the currently British and nationalists. In, in the past? Well, in, in a sense, if only they were. They, are, they, are, they sound more like English nationalists. Yeah. I think post yeah. after the um, after the Scottish referendum, I think uh, David Cameron's government, in campaigning for the next general election, made a horrendous, disgraceful decision to to attack Labour on the basis that Labour might go into coalition with parties in Scotland, as if this would be somehow shameful, as if we weren't a union where this kind of thing could happen. Uh, and I think, um, I think he, he was happy to, um, happy to alienate Scots in a quest for English votes. Uh, and I think there is a tone, even now, with the government in Westminster, where they, um, they call themselves unionists, they do not behave like unionists. Being a unionist involves respect for the constituent nations of this country. OK. Uh, you, you said in the blue check shirt, yes. We're talking about um, Wales and Scotland having their voice. Well, what about England? Uh, Wales, Scotland have an assembly or a parliament, yet the English have nothing. We're West talking Minster. about voices being heard. They've got Westminster. Yeah, so do you. Well, <laughs> if you listen to the debates that take place in Westminster, Wales doesn't get too much of a, a mention. It is mostly about matters pertaining to England. That's, that's the point. I mean, I'm in favour of an English parliament, but they do have Westminster. All right, uh, Brandon Lewis. Well, I, th I actually do think that the discussion about a referendum in, Scales in Scotland is a, is a distraction in the sense that they had a referendum um, just a short while ago and, and the vote from that was clear. And I think if you look at Wales, and I am a Conservative and Unionist, and I do believe we are stronger. And I think this is the key thing. I think we are stronger together and what we can do for our economies and our security um, across the United Kingdom. But actually not just taking the point around the polls here in Wales, but also looking at what is happening. The Welsh Act actually does devolve more powers to Wales. We have said as a government, as we repatriate powers from the EU, as we go through Brexit, there will be an opportunity to look at how we devolve even more powers out closer to people in all parts of the United Kingdom. So I think there is an opportunity there, and we are ultimately stronger together. It is a precious union across the United Kingdom, and we should the value Wales it. The Wales Bill right. was a massive missed opportunity. Right. Can we, I just no, ask hang one on a second, We've got 23% of people living in poverty here in Wales. How is that union good for Wales? Well, the, if, you, if you think about it, the, the, the question was talking about the, um, it, Wales having a referendum as we are exiting the EU when actually as we've talked about several times this evening Wales voted to leave the EU and we as the British government are delivering on Brexit and getting the right deal and the best deal for the United Kingdom. All right, Kingdom. The, man, the, man the, the, blue, the, Kingdom. the man in the blue pullover there, yes you sir. Uh, no, 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 in the thir third man from the, on the back row wearing a jacket with blue um, underneath it. I love being a student here in Wales and um, I think it would be a shame if they left the union. Um, I think they'd really struggle as well. Do you think there should be a vote on it? It's up to them, isn't it? Like, OK. You know. And the man in spectacles there and then come to you, Giles. Yes. Uh, the only thing I would say is uh, people in Wales decided to leave the EU um, to take power into their own hands and I don't think that automatically means that we want an independent vote because whether you like it or not, our vote goes to Westminster. That's just how our, our system right. works. But people Giles, want Giles, Giles, Giles Fraser. But, but, want Giles, Giles Fraser, please. But uh, here's the contradiction, uh, I think, in Leanne's position. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a Brexiter because I wanted power repatriated from Brussels. If I was Welsh, I'd want power repatriated from London. 
That's what I'd want as well. So I would, I, I, I understand. <laughs> I completely understand those people who want to have power much closer to, to where they live and to the people that they know. And that's why uh, I, I'm, it's, it's none of my business. But if the Welsh decided that they wanted to be an independent country, that's for the Welsh to decide. Right. And I'd understand why they did the, it. The woman in white there. Liam, well, you've already commented that Wales will struggle greatly when it leaves Europe. Uh, financially, how do you think the country will cope if it left England as well? Are you worried about that? Hold on, and I come to the woman here in the front. Yes. Point, Hold on. No, you only have to look at the fact that Wales has a fiscal deficit currently of just under 25%, compared to the UK deficit, I think, of 5%. That says a lot, really, about Wales's position outside of okay. the UK. I don't want to get stuck into the business of. Where, 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 you know, how Wales might vote, but can the I, question was about make, that. Can I just but, make uh, this point? Well, very quickly, to... please, because we've got only a minute left. I don't think that many people would disagree that there is a huge amount of potential in this country that is unlocked. The question that I would have to ask is, how do we best unlock that potential? Now, I think that we can do much more by doing more for ourselves. But if there's a unionist answer to this, uh, please let me know what it is, because... All I see is that Wales, our economy, has too many challenges. 23% of people are living in poverty. And uh, we're not getting any better in the system right. that we're in. But how so the state right. Wales would survive without the help that it currently gets from across the UK? Well, we I'm not saying that moment. we could achieve independence tomorrow. But at least if we had a plan to try and get there, then we could uh, make those improvements to our economy, I, I, I think, build I think, those institutions... I think you, that okay, have let, 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 let me let answer you, Leanne. I, I really do think that Leanne is living in some fantasy world. Um, of course... <laughs> Of course people want to be involved in decision making and what we have to do is we have to try to get the decisions made at the right level. So some things it's appropriate um, to have at a UK level, other things it's appropriate to have at a Wales or a Scotland level or at a local authority level, different levels of council. Right. How do we I mean, All right, okay, fine. Important. How we, we, do we, we All right, our, ta our time is up. That's a long discussion we can't get into. We can get into this last question with yes and no answers. From John Brook, please. Should the... Should the Prime Minister call a general election now? Should the Prime Minister call a general election now? And you can just say yes or no. You've got to speak. You can't be silent. Uh, uh, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, definitely. An election for you. Giles? No. No? Yeah. Yes. No, I think the Prime Minister is rightly focused on delivering a very important piece of work, doing the deal for Brexit, getting Brexit <laughs> done. We've got two years of negotiations. We've got to get that work done for the best interest of the country. We shouldn't right. be distracted by referendums or general elections. And John Brooke? She needs a mandate, and if she called an election now, I think she'd have the biggest Conservative majority in history. And you speak as a Conservative to a Conservative. But we've got to do what's right for the country before we think about what others might do about their party. Maybe. We're focused, the Prime Minister's rightly focused on what's right for the country. I think she needs a mandate. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a lone voice in the wind here because I live on Anglesey and I've voted Conservative, but there we are. OK, <laughs> fine. <laughs> That's it. Uh, our hour's up. I've been